Good morning. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Good morning, church family. Woo! Good day to be alive, hey? Thank you, Lord. We love you. Thank you for your presence here, that beautiful, beautiful worship. We don't ever want to take for granted the blessing to come together to worship you, to exalt your name. Yeah, more. Anybody want more? More, more, more of you. Lord, we love you, your glory, your fire, your presence, the kabod, the weightiness of your glory. Let it come, let it envelop us more, and Lord, we are hungry. Thank you for transformation that changes us. I'm going to speak today a message uh, basically entitled Peace, but I want to first share just a a prophetic storyline that I think is very relevant for us and back up to in the 30s when there was a woman by the name of Anna Kane who at age 45 was pregnant with a, uh, with a baby who, and she had four terminal illnesses as she was pregnant, double breast cancer, tumors in her womb, and tuberculos- tuberculosis. And, um, and an angel appeared to her and said that she would be completely healed of all of these illnesses, that her, she was gonna have a son, His name was to be Paul, and he would be known as a prophetic voice with a great healing ministry. Uh, Indeed, that all happened, and it was Paul Cain who was born, and um, in the 50s, he was well known as a healing evangelist, along with names like William Branham and Doug Coe and and, uh, uh, Jack Coe, I think it was, and others, and then he kind of went into wilderness years and came out as a real strong prophetic voice. Some of us would remember him. He came to Toronto, Uh, I'll I'll never forget, he kind of would wander until he would hit a zone, and when he hit the zone, he would just be so accurate, calling out names and addresses and people's middle names, and anyways, uh, I was privileged to receive a prophetic word from Paul Kane, and uh, I'll never forget it, May 24th of 1995, I was nine months pregnant with our daughter Aquila, at that time I went down under the power of the Spirit after this prophecy went into labor on the floor of the church in Toronto after that prophecy. And uh, somebody said, John Boots, my police come to the front, your wife is in labor. So there comes John, it's like 11 o'clock at night, picks me up, put me in the, hot, in the car, go to the doctor. And um, that was the most glorious, amazing, pain-free, I'm not joking, pain-free delivery. And I was like, the doctor would say, these contractions are strong. I'm like, oh, woohoo, woo! The doctor was a doctor for 25 years. He said, I've never been in a birth like that one. That was, anyways, that's another story. So uh, Paul Kane's mom, Anna Kane, she said to Paul, she said, the Lord showed me I was going to, I'm going to get a prophetic word for you before I die. It's very significant. And he said, mom, what's the word? She said, I don't know. God hasn't given me the word. So Anna's in her 90s, you know, and all through those years, and she's, you know, she still didn't get the prophetic word. She's 105, and she goes into a coma for two months, and Paul Kane says to all of his friends, pray my mother is healed because she's got to give me the prophetic word. And so all these people are praying and saying, this is weird. We're praying for a 105-year-old woman, but, you know, whatever. Okay, so they prayed, and then uh, Paul uh, calls up Mike Bickle, who is a friend to him, leader of IHOP, and he says, come, tomorrow my mom's going to die. And Mike said, how do you know she's going to die? He says, do you really need to ask me that? He says, okay, forget it, I'm coming. Goes to Dallas, and in the room that day is Paul Kane's mom, who's in the coma, Paul Kane, a nurse, and Mike Bickle. Um, all of a sudden, Anna Kane comes out of the coma that she'd been in for two months, whispers a word into her son's ear, falls back on the bed, and dies. That was April 18 of 1990, 4.18. Uh, Mike Bicka looked at the clock when she died. It was exactly 4.18 in the afternoon. And what was the prophetic word? The prophetic word was that Luke 4.18 was a critical scripture for not only Paul, but for the church to come as a new era would come upon the church as this Luke 4.18 was going to be released in another level. Now, what is Luke 4.18? It's when Jesus in Nazareth took the scroll in the synagogue and he read a portion of Isaiah 61. And it is this, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, to uh, recovery of sight to the blind, and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. 
Now, why is that relevant? Well, I'll just tell you another story. There's another guy by the name of Chris Reed. He hasn't been super well known, but he is, you know, I've, I've, we've seen him give like a hundred words again, super accurate. One family named all of their kids, you know, addresses, just real prophetic, but real humble too. Pastor from Illinois, he is. So he was for the first time ever going to be speaking in Kansas City. He's about to go to the first meeting, a leadership team meeting on April 9th of this year. In the car on the way, he hears that Prince Philip has passed. And why that is relevant is because in November of 2019, he had gotten a prophetic word from the Lord that said, when Prince Philip passes, it is a change for the church. And then the riddle that he got was this, when the prince has passed, 418 will be released at last. He didn't know what 418 meant, but he did remember it was Prince Philip. So he enters this meeting of the leaders on April 9th of this year, and he says, does 418 mean anything to you guys? And they said, yes, it means Luke 418. And why I want to say that I believe that is relevant is because the Lord is highlighting this scripture. And many have been hearing this for a while. And uh, on a Zoom yesterday with our Catch the Fire, or at least half of our worldwide Catch the Fire churches, we just were discovering that many of them, as of April 18th of this year, have felt another level of glory. Come on, somebody. I believe it. I believe that the Lord is saying he's releasing more signs and wonders. I believe that he is releasing the brokenhearted to be healed, captives to be set free. Gave a word in Alaska. We just returned from California, Alaska. Gave a word in Alaska for addictions. The front was full and people were getting free of their drug addictions, their alcohol addictions and every addiction. There is nothing too big for our God. Even if you have had years and years of struggling with something, it's time to look up your redemption has drawn nigh. I believe it. And then it was actually Ron Saka, who you guys know very well. He said, it's not even just a new season. It's a new era. Come on. It is a new era in the body of Christ. So I believe that. Now, this message today is about peace. And this is honestly based on a dream that I had where I felt like the Lord's saying that he's declaring war on anxiety, on depression, on things that hold his people back from living the fullness of their God-given destiny. So one time I was, this is a few years back, and I felt like the Lord speak to me about three levels of destiny. The first one he shared was about internal destiny. It's about you and me, like what's inside of us. Do you know that you go everywhere you go? Did you get, yeah. You know what? It's time that we actually enjoyed ourselves, right? That we really legitimately love ourselves and enjoy the journey. Second thing is this, that there is an external destiny. It's what you and I are called to do. Guess what? You and I are called to make a difference on planet Earth. You don't just get zapped out of here when you get saved. You are here to make a difference. That's your external destiny. And the last one, very important, your eternal destiny. Where are we going to spend forever and ever and ever? Massively important. That's much longer than this little life that we got here. So today we're going to talk a bit more about the internal destiny. So what is peace? What is that exactly? In the word in Hebrew is shalom. Now it's much more than being free of anxiety. This is what shalom means. It means completeness, wholeness, health, welfare, safety, soundness, tranquility, prosperity, perfectness, fullness, harmony, and the absence of agitation or discord. The root word is shalam, which means to be complete, perfect, whole. So in other words, this is the wholeness that the whole human race is really searching for. You know, you can just try to search for it in money or job or fame or whatever. Oh, it will always come up short. It is a shalom of from the Lord. The Lord says this in Psalm 35, says the Lord, the, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity, and that word is actually in, in the Hebrew, shalom. He has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. Let the Lord be magnified. I believe that God is magnified when his people walk in shalom. So in other words, he's declaring war on us not walking in shalom. Because this is our inheritance and he is glorified when we do. So let's look at, uh, first of all, a few peace stealers, or what are some of the robbers of our shalom? Well, number one is willful sin. 
willful sin, when we purposely walk away from God's will and, and commandments, because that's just going to get us into a whole lot of trouble. You know, John Mark Comer is an author uh, and pastor from Portland, and he said this, sexual immorality and pornography are one of the primary causes of depression around the world. It is impossible to be addicted to porn and have a happy, healthy, joy, and peace-filled life. Come on, somebody. I, don't, I, don't, I just am so feeling so strongly that the Lord's saying, I am declaring war on addictions. It's like God wants us free. And so willful sin, that's part of it. Another one is bitterness, unforgiveness, offense. All these things steal from shalom. So, of course, the enemy wants to trip us up by giving us lots of opportunity to have, you know, forgiveness issues or offense issues. And worry is another one. It says in Psalm uh, 37, 7, it says, do not worry. Sorry, do not fret. It only causes harm. You know what? I've heard this quote. Uh, anxiety is temporary atheism. <laughs> Interesting. We just kind of lose sight of God. You know, but let's look at that because it says in Proverbs 12, 6, anxiety in the heart of a man causes depression. Do you know that even doctors, co connection between anxiety and depression, that they're linked. They're most often linked. And usually it's the same medication that's prescribed for anxiety or depression. By the way, in this country, Check this out. There is 253 million, 253 million prescriptions each year are written for antidepressants or anti-anxiety medication. In one day in America, 94 people commit suicide. 94. That's about one every 15 minutes or 34,000 per year. Church, it ought not to be. God is declaring war on this robber in our country, in the, truly in the world at large. And so what, what does it take? You know, um, one of the things that we, I'll just, I just want to say this too. Another peace stealer, check this out, is laziness. Interesting. You know, there's so many proverbs that talk about the sluggard or the lazy man or, you know, can't even put his hand to his mouth or swedes in his garden. Do you know why? Because laziness is an affront to how God created us to actually work. That is, in the garden of even, even before the fall. Even before the fall, the Lord said to Adam, go and tend the garden. You and I are created to do something. Come on. You know, it robs people of dignity to say, we'll just give you handouts and you can stay at home. Truly, it's like we need to do something, even if it's volunteering. I've done so much volunteering in my life. I'm like, God, pay me back, please. But you know what I'm saying? It's like, like just I, I need to do something, you know, because otherwise there's a lack of joy there. Do you know what it says in Matthew 25 in the parable of the talents? It says, enter the joy of your master. What is that? For doing what you're called to do. And it multiplies. That is part of the uh, stealer of peace is if we don't, if we don't do anything. Here's another one, abuse that's a sin against us, and obviously that needs healing. And here is some other, these are struggles, but they're actually peace robbers. Perfectionism. <laughs> Perfectionism when everything just needs to be perfect. Or uh, introspection, too much navel gazing. Or uh, narcissism, that's where it's me, me, and me, me. As well as guilt, as well as the what if, what if that would happen, or what if, what if that happens, what if I do this and that happens, it's like, oh my goodness, it's hard to have peace if you got the what ifs rolling in your mind, as well as ingratitude. So let's look at some of the uh, heart essential. By the way, did you know that there's only a few things that the Bible says to pursue? We're to pursue righteousness, we're to pursue uh, the Lord himself, you know, Philippians 3, what Paul says, I press on to know him, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We are to pursue love, 1 Corinthians 14, and we are to pursue peace. That's Psalm 34, as well as, uh, first, um, as, well as 1 Peter 3, pursue peace. It's one of the things we're to go after. I'm praying today that we all just make a decision that we're going to go after shalom. And we're going to declare a war on whatever keeps us from shalom, either inside of us or in our homes. You know, years ago, we had made this decision, John and I, we said, this house is going to be house of peace. <laughs> so sibling rivalry, it's not okay. You know, we're going to go after peace. And so we just really, you know, ward for peace. Ward for peace. Sometimes we got to go to war to get peace. So the hard essentials for these robbers are, of course, repentance. 
You know what? It is so freeing to really do what it says in Psalm 32. And it says this, I acknowledged my sin. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and, your, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Wow. Isn't it freeing to acknowledge your sin? Come on. I remember, you know, John and I, we, we went to um, the, part of one week, was it more like six days, we were at a marriage retreat in California. It was a gift to us. It was beautiful, beautiful surroundings. And boy, I learned, I, you know what I learned? I learned that I could shoot a gun. Wow. It's a Canadian thing. You know, you don't do that too often in Canada. And actually, skeet shooting, Duncan, I actually hit the skeet shooting thing. I was so shocked. Maybe it's because a shotgun has so many bullets, you know. Anyways, I don't know, that was part of the marriage retreat. <laughs> we, we weren't aiming at each other, which was great. But uh, So we had this lovely marriage retreat, and then we're, uh, we're in Alaska. And um, anyways, it's a long story, but we just, just the smallest, stupidest little thing about how I pronounce this word that, you know, John's really good at pointing out my grammatical errors. And anybody have a spouse that points out all your grammatical errors? It's like, you know, just... Anyways, it was this little tiff that came in and lasted more than a day. Don't you hate that? Come on, I'm, I'm burying my soul right now. So when it was where we could actually confess our sin to one another, that we got free of it. Right, dear? Yes. <laughs> I got the microphone, you don't. Yes. Anyway, come on somebody. Guess what? It is not worth it. Hello. It is not worth, thank you, Shannon. It is not worth it when we carry on with some ridiculous, ridiculous argument. And it's like, it's no longer about who's right or wrong. It's just about let's establish unity, you know? And so, come on. And by the way, I think husband should always be the first to repent. But anyways, that's just my opinion. And I do have the microphone. Thank you. All right. So, okay. So, uh, Yes, repentance, forgiveness, of course, forgiving those who have hurt you, who have wronged you. It says this in Romans 12, it says, if at all possible, as much as possible, be at peace with all men. Be at peace with all men. And so as much as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. There may be times where you're just like, I've done everything, you know. And so anyway, so I was sharing this morning how I have this, uh, in my journal, I have a small list of short list of people that I feel have hurt me or whatever, but the Lord says how I get free of that is by praying for them. So I have their names really small. I'm not sure why. Maybe I want God to small, like bless them small. But anyways, I do bless them. And so I found that actually I get free of that by blessing them. And it's amazing how walls come down and yeah, even the Lord reestablishes contact. So it, it is as much as possible, you want to pray for the person, it sets you free. Not only forgive them, but pray for them. So here is how do we get peace? Well, number one, it's really Jesus himself. You know, it's Isaiah 53, you know that, that chapter. It says this, he was wounded for our transgression, bruised for iniquities. But listen to this, the chastisement for our peace was upon him. Wow. In other words, on him, he took the penalty so that we can walk in shalom. We can walk in wholeness. We can walk in prosperity. We can walk in health. We can walk in, in absence of, of conflict and fear. Wow. We want, you know what? Jesus wants to get what he paid for. So it's not that we got a ticket to heaven. Hallelujah, got a ticket to heaven, but I'm anxious, I'm worried, I'm uptight, I'm upset, I'm fighting with everybody. No, he died to give us abundant lives. Come on, somebody. That we would love him and be on fire for him, that we're walking in this. So he himself, that he, bought, he purchased it for us. It's Luke 179 that says, Jesus came to give light to those who sit in the darkness and the shadows of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And in Greek, it's Irene, peace. You know, um, there is something very powerful about when we allow God to invade our circumstances. We have a special needs daughter. We have six children, by the way, five daughters and one son. 
And our daughter, uh, Phoebe, is 23 years old. She's in Canada. I'm on FaceTime a lot with her. So many Amazon packages I send to her. But she's doing great. She's in a Christian home. It's called uh, L'Arche. But when she, you know, when I got the diagnosis that, that there was something wrong, really it's just a catch-all global development delay. So I remember just so, oh, it was like one of the worst times of my life. Just in anxiety and every prayer, Phoebe, Phoebe, God, this is not fair. And God, oh, like I was, I was blaming myself. And there was many things. It was just such a time of turmoil. And I remember being in the church in Toronto the one day. And I was in a vision. It was a very strange encounter, but I was in the vision. In the vision, I'm in the boat with the disciples as the winds and the waves are tossing the boat. And I was with them. It's weird, I know, but I was physically feeling seasick, like as though I could throw up. And I remember Carol coming over, Carol Arnett, who you saw a few weeks ago. She came to me. She said, what's going on with you? And I said, well, I don't know, but I know it's related to Phoebe. And I just feel this sense of turmoil. My life is like upside down. And I'm with the disciples in the boat, by the way. And she said, peace be still. And something lifted off my life. I'll never forget it. From that moment on, regarding Phoebe, and there was a lot we could tell you about the, you know, the times, but I just, perfect peace. Even where she would just rally, you know, I, I usually, I just would always stay in peace. And I feel like that was a moment when I really realized how much Jesus coming in breaks everything that robs peace. And in that time, he said, you know, will you love me anyway? Will you serve me anyway? Will you get up and pray for the sick? And will you preach anyway, even if you have a daughter that's not yet healed? And I said, God, yes. It's like the disciples, where am I going to go anyways? You know, you are the answer. So I'm, yes, I'm all in. And I pledge my allegiance to Jesus. I pledge my allegiance to the Lamb. I do not understand why. But the point is, we can trust him. We're not going to always get it right. I, if we understand God, then yeah. Like his ways are higher. I don't know. But all I know is this. He has blessed us. He has blessed her. And there's something of our faith level coming up. You know when uh, David said, I've been young and I've been old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen them begging bread. You know, I just want to tell you one more thing about Phoebe. Do you know that the average wait time in Canada, now this is government funded by the way, but wait time in Canada to have a home that is fully paid for is 40 years, four zero. So we're like, oh my goodness, that's why you see so many people, you know, the, the, the wait list was 87 people, in one year they placed three. Phoebe got in in two years. Something a God pulled off a miracle. And she's very happy, like she loves it there, there are all the kinds of programs, and she was ready to get out of the home, you know. But my point is this, God will come through. I don't understand, but God comes through. He is so faithful, and he's causing our faith level to rise up on another degree. The mind, the mind is so powerful, the mind. And we know from Ephesians 4, it says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Put off the old man, put on the new man. And the linking verse is, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And it says in 1 Corinthians 20, it talks about, first, where is it? 1 Corinthians, blah, 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 somewhere. I got it here. Thank you, Jesus. First, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Have you ever paid attention to what you're thinking about? It was really a Mark Verkler who taught me this years ago. Because he said, I started to pay attention to my thoughts and I realized that 80% of my thinking was negative and 20% was positive. And then he says this audacious statement. He says, everything negative is from the enemy and everything positive is from God. So I was like, whoa, I should maybe pay attention to what I'm thinking about. And I started to pay attention and it was not pretty. It was not a pretty statistic. So I'm like, God, I want to do this. So years ago, I did it. I started to take every thought captive. Oh, what's that thought? Oh, what's that thought? And actually started to war against negative thinking. And then I would read things like, you know, Philippians 4 that talks about not just what is, what is true, but it goes on to what is lovely, what is wholesome, what is of a good report. Dwell or meditate on these things. It's called replacement tactic. 
It means get rid of the negative by putting in a positive. And so I started to do that. I started to, you know, I, I memorized parts of the Bible, and I would just start to, whenever I was feeling like a bit, I don't know, something wrong in my mind, I would start to memorize, go over that memory scripture, and I found that that little exercise, which wasn't easy, I want to say that, but something broke off my life. When I grew up, it was almost like I always had a problem, always chaos, 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 chaos. And I remember the Lord speaking to me one day, he said, Patricia, guess what? You don't even have, you don't have to have a problem. I said, what? Like problem was my friend. And he said, no, I'm going to set you free from that unholy alliance with problems. I was like, praise God. Wow. And it changed my inner destiny, my inner calling in God, which I don't believe we can really, you know, see the full expression of our external destiny if we don't get the internal right. If we don't see this level of breakthrough that God wants to give us, and so another thing is to process emotions. We learned this, um, uh, Marie and I were talking about the connection codes a bit ago. I think we're going to do it in the fall again. It's a, it's a course, really, but learning how to process emotions. And there's something very powerful to this, because did you know that intense emotions shut down cognition? So in other words, some of the stupidest things that people do is because they're under intense emotions. It might be rage, it might be uh, fear, it might be just intense, intense. In other words, your brain shuts off when you're under intense emotions. Have you seen domestic abuse or go talk to the average prisoner and it's because they were under intense emotions, lost their head and did something very stupid. And so in other words, when we learn how to process emotions properly, it's very good for us. And, you know, if we haven't processed emotions, it can actually be stuffed down, stuffed down, meaning that it can actually affect our bodies, like as in health-wise. That's, that's medically proven, that if we don't process emotions, it can actually affect us physiologically. And so um, this pain, by the way, that we can feel emotionally is, do you know that our mind or our body does not discern emotional pain and physical pain? It's just pain. It's all the same. And so uh, I was recently, you know, there was something just in my extended family, and I was telling my siblings, you know, the standard line, hey, forgive. You know, we just, we just rip up the IOU, and, and, and I felt like I really did forgive. The only problem was I wasn't actually processing the fact that I was hurt by this too. And so just, you know, just recently, like I, two weeks ago, I was just with a friend, but anyways, just began to share some of this, and, and it was like a lid came off. And all of these tears started flowing. Do you know that tears can be very cathartic? Very, very healing. And I felt like I stood up after that and I felt like something came off. A weight came off. Do you know sometimes we need to get the lid off the stuffed down pain? And I was a nurse. I used to be a nurse. I, I ended up uh, in emergency room nursing. But do you know what you do with the uh, a boil or a pus-filled cavity in your body? Guess what? It's called IND, incision and drainage. You got to kick that thing. You got to squeeze it or you got to, you know, sometimes it's a surgical procedure where you remove the pus because putting a Band-Aid on that thing is not going to heal it. Somebody, we have to get rid of some of the pus inside of us. And say, God, I invite you into this pain. I invite you into that injustice. I invite you because I am done with just ignoring it. Because it's coming out. It's coming out some way or another. And I'd rather it came out in an inner healing session than in a, uh, a conflict with somebody else. So the Lord is doing this. I was praying for a guy and, um, you know, he was really, really... Sh shut down in his emotions. He was super flatlined. Even the way he talked was really flatlined. And so I was like kind of dancing around trying to pray for him. I was trying to figure out what to say. And I, and I said this word. I said, you know, it's kind of like, you know, Spock. You know Spock from Star Trek? Anybody know what I'm talking about, Spock? He was real, you know, no emotions. And this guy says, yeah, I've really admired Spock all my life. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is the problem right here. I think we need to stop admiring Spock, okay? So that was one door because he Repented for admiring Spock. And uh, by the way, just want to say this. Did you know that Spock comes from, he, he, that character actually came from a Dr. Spock who taught, it was really my mom's generation, 
taught uh, parents, don't be spoiling that kid. Don't hug that kid too much. Just put him in the nursery and put him in the crib because, you know, it's schedules. And I'm not saying there's anything bad about schedules, but much like lack of affection, lack of affection. And a whole generation who bought into that really found that it was hard to get in touch with emotions. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Some of you know psychology. You know what I'm talking about. So anyway, so I think we need to get free of some of this lack of being in touch with our emotions. And I see women nudging their husbands. Okay, it's not a... But, you know, we need to get in touch with what's there. And I know women, you know, maybe are a bit more in touch with emotions. But the fact is that it's important to process. It's important to recognize that we are emotional beings. Words is another way that we can gain um, peace. Proverbs 12, 25 says, anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. Do you know, Proverbs 18, life and death are in the power of the? Right. You know, I know from my biology class that the most muscle mass of any part of your body is right there in the tongue. In other words, you had that same level of muscle mass in your legs, you'd be jumping like tigger, tigger. You know, so in other words, isn't it incredible that God puts this very small, high concentration of muscle mass thing and says, bridle your tongue. Whoa. Do you know what teleos is? It's the Greek word for perfect. And the Lord says, he who bridles his tongue is perfect. Wow. Spiritual maturity. I think I want some spiritual maturity. Anybody want some spiritual maturity? Here it is. Bridle your tongue. God said it. God said it. It's not me. God said it. In other words, I remember sometimes just going in the bathroom, just like, ah, just wanting to tell John right off, you know? But the Lord said, no, don't do that, because I am helping you bridle your tongue. So women, you know why? <laughs> we can tear them down or we can build them up. So much of it is the words that we speak, the power of our words. So when we start to change the way that we speak, think, and here's a big key, is thankfulness. The biology of gratitude, this was a 2003 study called the, bio, it's, it's counting blessings versus burdens. And this was what was discovered physiologically by those who kept a Thanksgiving journal. I have a Thanksgiving journal. It's separate from my journal journal, and I recommend everybody gets one of these. And what you do is you write down things that you are thankful for. Come on, somebody. Little things, big things, the sun that rises. You know what? I really have a problem when people complain about America. I was like, just go to some of the other nations in the world and see if you're going to complain about America. Come on. It's ridiculously blessed. You turned on the tap and water came. You had a shower. Yay. Food. Praise you, Jesus. It's time to be thankful. So anyway, so what we, this is the biology of gratitude. This is what uh, has happened, what they've discovered after we are thankful that there is, uh, we have more, ooh, here it is. We have more, the dopamine level, the hypothalamus produces more dopamine, causes to sleep better, causes decrease of pain, causes decrease of stress, anxiety, and depression, increases energy, lengthens lifespan, decreases blood pressure, boosts the immune system, improves self-esteem, increases productivity, job performance, and makes one more likable and happy. Do you think it's okay to start to practice Thanksgiving? Like seriously, that's just physiologically, let alone, you know, it, it just what changes in our spirit, man. The Lord said in Psalm 100, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. There is something that we enter into a new level when we are thankful. There is so much to be thankful for. When Jesus had, the, remember the fish and the loaves? He broke them and then what happened? They multiplied. And so it is that there's something here that causes us to shift when we are thankful. So there's a connection between a good life, a positive tongue, and peace. How do we impart it? Um, Tato, if you want to come up to the keyboard, that's great. You know, there's a story from 9-11. This is a true story. I heard this years ago, and it really affected me. I thought about it a lot. And it is where there was a, um, a custodian who worked in the second tower. When the plane hit the second tower, the CEOs and business guys that were, you know, making 100000 or more per year were on their cell phones trying to get help, trying to, because the, the, the um, elevator was affected. 
Instead, this guy, the custodian, pulls his mop apart, pries open the elevator door, takes another part of his mop and bores a hole into the uh, dry, drywall or sheetrock, and he grabs these guys and he says, follow me. They followed him through that hole into the, uh, the floor below them. They entered the men's bathroom and he led them through the stairwell and they got out just in time. True story. Now, why is that relevant? I felt like the Lord's saying that that's like us, the church of Jesus Christ, is, as things unfold in the earth. Isaiah 60 talks about deep darkness covers the earth, but the glory of the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. Guess what? We have the end of the story right here. We know that we win. We know that Jesus is coming. We know that there is victory in him. In other words, we will be the ones to say to the world, come on, let's go this way. It's the way of God and it's the way of salvation and it's the way of shalom, peace. We are to affect the atmosphere wherever we go. In your workplace, when you show up, shalom shows up. When you go into your, your home or wherever, um, when we were in Alaska, uh, having dinner with some friends in Anchorage, and the uh, waitress, you know, you could just tell she was kind of flustered. She was trying to, you know, she was busy or whatever. And I saw in my mind, it's really strange, but I like read over her. It's not like there was anything visibly wrong with her stomach, but I saw the word stomach and I'm like, God, is that you? And I said, speak it. So I said, ma'am, is there anything wrong with your stomach? And her eyes went wide like a saucer and she said, she said, I've got a tumor in my stomach. I said, well, you know, God showed that because he wants to, he wants to heal you. So we prayed for her and I'm telling you, this woman was so visibly changed. She gave her life to Jesus. She gave her life and I could feel the glory of God going into her. She said, I feel something coming into me. So we need to see now reported, you know, from a doctor, but she connected with my friend who was there and said, I want to, I want to hang out with you. Can I be with you? And, and she, you know what? God encountered that woman from in a restaurant. And I just feel like the Lord's saying, church, bring shalom, bring my presence, bring my glory, wherever you are in the school or in, you know, wherever that's what we are to impart, bring shalom wherever you go. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. John, can you come with some of the men that you have? You know, during worship uh, on the first service, I had these C's that were coming to me. I was like, I feel like the Lord said he wanted to get free, free of criticism. Uh, he wanted us to get free of, of um, uh, ugh. he just wanted us to be free. And one of them actually, if I, I remember now, criticism, complaining. And the other one I, I remembered during worship just now is um, free of control. And, you know, we had this crazy little exercise. What was crazy little exercise during the, uh, during the marriage weekend. And I, it, was, it was called a trustful. It was actually more intimidating than what it looks like. Maybe, Jonathan, can you help me up here? I just want you to hold the mic in a second. So anyways, but you know, it was like you were to ask God for a word that you're, no, right here. Uh, you were to ask God for a word that you needed, like the, or word or th whatever, that you were going to let go. And I, and I got a word. I got a word about competition, you know. It's like the Lord. Anyway, so we, those that were willing, not everybody did it. But we're going to do this trust fall. <laughs> During worship just now, I was like, the Lord said, I want you to do a trust fall. I'm like, God, this is either you or this is really stupid. But anyways, I'm going to demonstrate this. But when we come forward for ministry in a moment, I want you to think about doing a trust fall with Jesus and saying, I'm going to give up criticism. I'm going to give up worry. I'm going to give up complaining. I'm going to give up whatever it is. Ask God. Even now, ask God. So this is the trust fall. Uh, you guys, you guys are trustworthy, right? Okay. Is it that? Whatever. Okay. Come, Holy Spirit, please help me, Jesus. I pray. Thank you, guys. Helps to have strong guys, too. Let's all stand together. How about we do a trust fall with Jesus? How about we give up control? How about we give up criticism? How about we give up worry and anxiety? 
How about we just say, Lord, I trust you. I need you. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come. Holy Spirit, will you search our hearts? What peace robbers, what shalom robbers have been happening in us, God? We want to get rid of them this morning, God. We want to surrender. We want to repent for anything that robs us of shalom. We want to dive into the deep end with you. Over my head, Ezekiel's river, Ezekiel 47. Ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, then over the head. You know, that's where God wants us to be. Where it's not me and my control, not me and my good works. It's where God, if you don't come through, I'm going to sink. But Lord, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you. Come and break in. Come and break in. You know, we, one of our daughters wrestled with a phobia. It was actually a phobia of spiders. And I remember we were like, we need a microphone. We need a microscope to see this spider. But she would pick them out. And we didn't realize, do you know there's 600 and something different phobias? And the Lord set our daughter free. We prayed. And yes, we, I believe in counseling. But anyways, I didn't realize that was, you know, that was a real thing. I think it's arachnophobia, right? It's fear of spiders. Come on, somebody. I just want you to come forward if you know that you need more shalom in your life. Let's just, let's just meet with God. It's not so much about who prays for you, but I do want you to come and say, God, I want to meet with you. I want shalom. I want peace. I want not only freedom from anxiety, discouragement, depression, but I want freedom to walk in welfare, in, 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 in my heart, my soul, prosperity. I want to walk in health. I want the abundant life that you died to give me. By his stripes were healed. The chastisement of our peace fell upon him. So I want to do this exchange right now, God. I want to give you everything that robs me of shalom. I want to take your peace. So break in. Oh, God. God, we love you. We thank you. You know, there's going to be more, more miracles. Duncan, more miracles in Catch the Fire. I tell you, I'm seeing it. It's so amazing. I just want to say to those that are here, God is expanding Catch the Fire all over the world. Yesterday, you know, there was Chinese churches all over that have joined this movement. Sierra Leone churches, many more. We bless Duncan and Kay. We bless Catch the Fire. God, you are causing this movement to arise in the earth and to make a massive difference in the saving of a billion soul harvest. Ah! Let the lion of the tribe of Judah roar. He is roaring over us. Ha! Church, maybe this seems crazy and I don't, I don't mind looking crazy, but I feel like we need to roar. Is that okay? The lion of the tribe of Judah. I don't know if anybody can jump on these drums for a moment, but I just, I feel like the lion of the tribe of Judah is roaring. I feel like he's roaring over us to have shalom. He's roaring us to have freedom. He's roaring for the brokenhearted to be healed. He's roaring for the captives to be set free. He is roaring that the blind would receive sight. The lion of the tribe of Judah is roaring over you and roaring over me. Come on, break in, Holy Spirit. Fire. Yeah, Justin, just jump up here one second. Feel like we're going to, this is nice music, but I just feel we need to ramp it up if that's okay. I just, in a count of three in a moment, I want us to just begin to roar and say, it's like I'm roaring that the walls of Jericho would come down. The walls around my heart and life, the walls that have kept me bound when I know God has called me for freedom. So right now, the lion of the tribe of Judah is roaring. He is roaring over you. He is roaring over me. He is roaring for freedom from his church. We are on the offense. We're not just on the defense. We are on the offense to take the land, to see his fire burn. You know, years ago, there was a man by the name of Gideon Chu. I remember this when he started to roar like a lion in Toronto. And John Arnett called him up and said, Gideon, what's going on? And he said, all I know is the lion of the tribe of Judah is roaring over the dragon of China. And do you want to know something? That man has been used of God and more, like David Damien, to see millions in China come to Jesus and be set free from the dragon. 
And I believe that people are gonna get set free this morning from a dragon spirit, from false religions, from addictions, from depression, from anxiety, from anything that binds us. So in the name, just Justin, just quickly, come Holy Spirit, let your fire fall. Let your glory come. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, the chastisement of our peace fell upon Him. The war for our peace was upon Him. We're gonna receive it this morning. We're gonna receive it for our movement. We're gonna receive it for ourselves. We're gonna receive it for our children. We're gonna receive it, Father, for America, because America will be saved. You've said America will be saved. On the count of three, one, two, three. of Judah, freedom, 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 say yes. Say yes. We say yes. We say yes. There's an obedience. There's an obedience the Lord is asking us. We say yes. We say yes to the nudges. We say yes to you, Jesus. We pledge our allegiance to the Lamb. We pledge our allegiance. Just say yes to Him. I say yes to you, Lord. I say yes. I receive shalom. I bring shalom wherever I go. I say yes to the nudges of repentance. I say yes to your will and your way. We say yes. Our God is a consuming fire and our God is consuming us this morning because we want to be on fire. Let your fire fall. Let your glory come.